important for the, especially starting out in the younger ages to understand it's, it's a safety issue it has nothing to do with promoting the NRA I saw a piece where it talks about the difference between um, real guns and video games and another thing along that lines is uh, in all my town meetings that I went to nobody really except for Lowell they, they talk quite a bit about gun control no, nobody else did except for grabbing me in the hall as I was leaving they didn't want to get a big discussion on the floor but an interesting uh, discussion that I had with a teacher who taught 7th and 8th graders was uh, after the uh, Parkland shooting, um, he had asked his students, uh, how many of you, and this is out of the blue, how many of you since yesterday have killed one, someone in a video game? And they all raised their hands. And then he asked, how many of you have killed over 200 people since yesterday? And eight people raised their hands. So I think that's concerning. I know when my, my girls, they're a little older now, we're growing up, fortunately, uh, there wasn't cell phones out, but there was um, rap music. Um, there was, if you ever listen to some of the lyrics of uh, Dr. Dre and others, it's, it's pretty disturbing when it talks about killing cops and so on and so forth. So again, I think that uh, there's some sort of a program, and I think it's been around there for a long time, uh, the reason I pulled the amendment back in the day was because of the number of man mandates that we already put on schools. But I think when you're talking about a safety issue this huge, I think it's something that should be considered again. And another uh, situation that I had, this was probably five or six years ago. There was a retired military and border patrol agent that uh, offered his services to the local schools as well as he knew other people. So this would have been on a voluntary basis to be involved in the schools. Again, not to be just some guard at the door, um, but an individual who, uh, you know, enjoyed uh, kids and, and, and uh, interacting with them and so on and so forth. So he had offered his services as well as others. Um, it was on a uh, unscheduled basis in a sense he couldn't do it five days a week that sort of thing but uh, uh, I believe that uh, there is an opportunity out there for that sort of thing to happen I think it, it's a great combination to have uh, older folks that are retired that have the time that want to be involved I mean I'm, there'd have to be guidelines around it I, I saw that right. uh, yeah um, but I just uh, and one of the reasons I'm mentioning it because uh, it, it really was a, a viable option years ago I did go around and talk to some of the schools, but again, the atmosphere at that time was uh, something that uh, they didn't they didn't want to uh, move with. And I'm sure there's going to have to be a lot of parameters around something like that. Uh, but again, I think uh, uh, those uh, two particular um, uh, initiatives will help. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, uh, so many kids these days seem to fear. Uh, going to school, I don't, I don't know. Just, um, um, I think it's important for teachers and parents and so on to, to do their best. Uh, I know maybe it's been mentioned here too, but when I was growing up in the in the first and second grade, uh, we had our um, drills. One of them was a nuclear drill um, where we had to open the windows. An individual was uh, uh, specifically um, every week uh, set up to open the windows, and then we had to get under our desks. Uh, my parents had built a uh, fallout shelter, bomb shelter in their basement when they put on an addition. But I never remember completely going to school and being so fearful and, and so on and so forth. So um, again, I, I hope there's, um, there's, there's ways that, that we can uh, work through this, but uh, uh, I believe as well as a lot of my constituents that talk to me that so many of these gun control initiatives aren't going to work. So. Basically, that's that's my spiel, and I appreciate the time to sit down and, and say that. All right. Well, well, thank you, and I and I appreciate your remarks. Um, can I get a copy of your of your resolution? Because they're um, I know the Senate is going to be working on a school safety bill, um, which will come to us and Gary. Uh, I believe there's a lot of interest in that. I'll see if I can dig it up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. I'd like to look at that, and then um, and also, can you? Um, Remind me of the, the website that you just referred to. Sure, if you yeah. just go to the uh, Eddie Eagle Gun Safe Program, yeah. you should bring it up. It's it's uh, sponsored by the NRA, but okay. uh, this is uh, just to give you a look. Um, I have it right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
have a 13-year-old so son is, who... So uh, this is what you'll see when you okay. get to it? Yeah, great. I was going to say, I so, have a 13-year-old son who very much likes those games. And yeah, and this is the, so these are the, char these are the characters. Yeah. And uh, you really need to go through it for yourselves to yeah. listen to what they say and how, they're, how they present it. And, yeah. and uh, it, it's also not even a specific presentation in a sense because they believe when it, when it does go to schools that the teachers know best as to whether to do it on a, on a larger basis or individually or smaller groups, that sort of thing. So it's, it's there's a lot of leeway there, let's put it that way. So. Great, great, thank you. So, so it's my understanding that the education committee is having a joint uh, hearing today. I don't know if yeah. they probably have people lined up already, but just I don't know if you're aware of that. They're yeah. looking at those kind of issues. I am, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah three to five. Uh, okay, down in room 11 now, is it? Or up probably, there? I would think one of these, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again. I appreciate yeah. the time. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Um, for the record, my name is Kara Cookson. I'm with the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Um, I'm here to testify in S55. Um, and you'll hear from me some points that you've heard me make before, but um, I think it's important that they're noted for the record on this bill. Uh, so by statute, um, the center is responsible for promoting the rights and needs of Vermont's crime victims. And so that's why we're here um, to testify in gun legislation today. Um, we represent um, the needs of, um, we represent the needs and interests of homicide survivors. Um, we, uh, we represent um, uh, children um, who have witnessed um, Homicide and crime. We, we work with uh, we work with those survivors as well, um, and so uh, that's why I'm here. Um, additionally, um, the Center's Victims Compensation Program pays thousands of dollars each year on behalf of um, surviving families and homicide victims uh, to cover the cost of funerals, headstones, uh, crime scene cleanup, and mental health counseling to cope with grief. Um, and you've heard me say this before, but I will say it again. Um, we believe that the criminal justice system in our society as a whole benefits whenever we shift the paradigm from simply responding to crime and its aftermath to enacting evidence-based reform shown to actually prevent crime from happening at all. Um, and so for that reason, um, the center applauds the leadership of both chambers, um, as well as um, Clearly, this committee um, and Attorney General Donovan, Commissioner Anderson, uh, Commissioner Cole, and Governor Scott for their support um, of these proactive approaches uh, to firearm start storage and disposal, which is contained in the bill and is really important. That's sort of a precursor to a lot of the other legislation in the building. Um, the issues involving um, firearms removal, which aren't necessarily contained in this bill, but is another subject of debate in the building. And, and um, clearly the measures here that are aimed at homicide and suicide prevention and um, we support all the provisions here. Um, and um, we think that they represent significant steps forward. Um, so that's my, that's my testimony and we're, we're very grateful that you want to take me the time on these issues. Any questions? Uh, um, of the proposals that are on the table now, are there any <coughs> in particular that the center is, you know, feels more strongly about? Or? Um, you know, I will, I will say that um, we, I'm certainly not the expert on sort of the. <coughs> the evidence-based um, rationales for some of the um, uh, some of the provisions in the bill that are specific to, um, you know, who can purchase a firearm, who can, you know, the um, high-capacity um, magazines, those, those types of issues. Um, uh, although, um, we certainly, we've heard testimony and have a quality issue, and we find the testimony that you have heard very compelling. Um, frankly, I think the issue that is the most significant in the bill um, is the gun storage issue. Um, you know, the testimony that um, we heard um, in the Senate committee is that, I mean, this has been, um, it, it's been an issue irrespective of the gun removal provisions that the committees have been considering um, for a really long time now. And so, again, um, if nothing else, that that provision is just 
so important to getting at the larger challenges that we have. Um, and uh, again, we're so grateful to Commissioner Anderson and Commissioner Cole for willing to step up and, and come up with solutions to the problem. Um, and we're really grateful to law enforcement for being willing you know, to come to the table and figure out how to solve these challenges. Because for us, um, the idea that we, we can't remove guns because we already have too many <laughs> um, is, is just a really unfortunate reason to not take steps on gun removal. Um, that, you know, that, well, we don't know what to do with this abandoned property. Um, you know, I'm really glad that um, that the administration has stepped up um, to figure out what to do with it. So, I have just a second support of that part of the bill too, because I, you know, when we were discussing it here, I was thinking, gosh, that would be great if I could go out on the floor and talk about you know, the, the provisions of 422 and not have anybody question me about what we're going to do about storing those guns. So, yeah. No, it's it's really important. You know, I, one of the things that <laughs> I know, you know, on, likewise on the removal provisions. I mean, one of the things I've said is, you know, would you would you rather um, remove uh, remove firearm to prevent a homicide or remove it as evidence of a homicide, right? And and I think that we, you know, in reasonable circumstances, we would we would rather remove the weapon for that homicide, right? But because of these storage issues, it, it really has. Um, caused some concern about what that looks like. So, Kara, I can't remember if you were here yesterday when um, Commissioner Schatz testified. Uh, yes, I was. So, I mean, I find it interesting and uh, also concerning. I mean, it's, it's great that we're making sure that children in foster homes are as safe as they can be and I know that the foster parent licensing and adoption licensing are really pretty stringent processes, which they should be because we're, you know, letting them take care of the children in our state's custody. But it made me take pause because, again, most states do have that kind of um, regulation for foster homes. So, so just the children in Vermont, and I don't know how many victims you saw that are victims of accidental shootings, or if they don't end up coming to sure. your office, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on that issue. Um, to be honest, I hadn't come prepared today having formulated a, a position on that particular issue, and and probably, I mean, in part, um, because so many of these issues are sort of new and coming to the fore for the yeah, first time, yeah. and and also because, um, like you identified, in these in the the accidental shooting context, um, we don't actually have a crime that's occurred, and so. Um, I, I don't have access to information or statistics on that because um, there's no crime. They don't come to us for services. Um, but I, I, I think your point is well taken. And, I mean, it certainly is just a Vermonter, right? It's, it's a certainly um, a really important question to raise and, and one to put some thought into. But unfortunately, no, I hadn't formulated a position on DCF's policy because it, it's um, sort of out of the realm of the center purview. Anything else? Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we have draft one four point one that um, we posted yesterday afternoon. But um, look, can you please sure. uh, we'll walk through again? Yeah. Can we get hard copies? I have a um, big oh, sure. sure. yeah. yeah. four point one. Good morning, everyone. Luke Moore, Land Director of Legislative Council. And as the chair indicated, this is a new draft, and it should say draft number 4.1 on the upper left-hand corner. Does everyone have the correct version? And it still has yellow highlights 
as to the text that I went through yesterday. If it's okay with the chair, what I'll do is just point out what's different from yesterday. And the first uh, significant difference is on page six. This is in section six, and this is the background check section. If you remember, there was some discussion yesterday about antique firearms. And what the changes you see under one, which is on line eight, it states that firearm shall have the same meaning as in the new <laughs> language's subsection 4017D of this title. And um, if you remember, 4017, we referenced this last week, has a definition of firearm that is quite broad. It defines a firearm as any weapon that will, is designed to, or may be readily converted to, expel a projectile by means of an explosive. But it then states that it shall not include, in other words, a firearm shall not include an antique firearm, which was made prior to 1898, um, a replica of such antique, or various other categories, such as uh, black powder or muzzle loader. So in other words, I think this achieves the objective of excluding antiques, replicas, black powder, and other types of uh, antique type weapons from the definition of firearm. So I think that achieves what the committee wanted to do. Are there any questions about that? The next um, text I wanted to mention was on page nine. This is not a change, but I wanted to explain why it is not. You'll see F on lines four through eight, and this is the um, immunity section that we talked about yesterday, and there was a question about whether it should be here or move to a different subsection of the same statute, and we kept it here simply because that's what we normally do. At the end of the statute, we have one big exception, and it covers the whole preceding statute. So. Next, I'd like to go to page 10, please. And you'll see this is now the sale of firearm to minors of section seven. And if you flip to page 10, uh, if you remember the last draft, I think there was some language about uh, the hunter safety course, but then there was other language about potential other courses and that needed perhaps to be tweaked. That's been removed. So what the bill now does, or what the amendment now does, is it has an exception for a person who provides a seller with a certificate of satisfactory completion of a Vermont hunter safety course, that was all prior language, or an equivalent hunter safety course that is approved by the commissioner. So it has to be a hunter safety course, it could be a Vermont one, or it could be another similar hunter safety course that has been approved by the commissioner. Any questions about that? And I believe that is all the changes from the draft that you saw yesterday. Are there any questions about anything? And the um, safe storage was with that. I don't know without a prior one, but it's not in here. That's, that's also true. Like, yeah. yep. Any other questions about anything either that I just covered or anything else? <laughs> so, um, so sure. look, if you can, um, sure. can we do a walk through the entire bill? Sure, because absolutely. We've taken things out, changing it, so just to, yep. so we can do it. And I hate this, but I have to take my reading glasses. <laughs> so, um, once again, we're in draft 4.1. Um, and Please stop me if there's any questions. I won't read line for line, but please stop me if you need more information about any provision. <clears throat> so beginning on section one, this has to do with the disposition of abandoned firearms. And so section two, a lot of these changes are merely capitalization. I'm sure you've gone through them. The important parts would be on page two where you have the definition of unlawful per se, which means a firearm, as Eric previously explained, that someone should not have, period. It's unlawful to possess, period. And then abandoned firearms, in other words, firearms that it would be lawful for someone to possess, but they've been taken for some reason and they haven't been reclaimed. So that's the important distinction. And, and um, these sections so far as passed by the Senate are the underlying yeah. That is my understanding, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think I can double check with that as yeah. to Eric, but that is my understanding. 
Uh, section three, disposition of unlawful firearms. And this is where you get into the language that BGS, in other words, the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services, would be taking custody of these instead of the state treasurer. And I think that was explained to you why that's being recommended. And then the procedure um, to dispose of those firearms. Any questions about that general concept or how that would operate? And if you see on page four, we talked about this yesterday, but the highlighted text is just ensuring that proceeds from those sales would go back to the municipality and be used to offset the cost of storing those firearms. Um, yeah. Um, yep. Jeff, I'm just looking for the section there that uh, talks about how they are then treated. Um, Can you tell me what page, please? Well, that's what I'm trying to find. Oh, okay. Is the, where is the section that talks about um, how they are to be disposed of? Wasn't there language about them going through an FFL? There is. Let me just find it for you, please. Because the, the place that I'm looking at is page four, line four. And I don't know. Or does it just reference back you see, to. It, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, let me so cut you off. Page, page, three, page, page three. Yeah. Yep, it says sale to a federally licensed firearms dealer. It's not capitalized, however. Okay. Pursuant to the commissioner's authority, et cetera. <laughs> Great. Okay. And that's as to, once again, the important distinction, that's as to abandoned firearms, ones that would be lawful for a person to possess that were seized and have not been reclaimed. That the difference between per se, illegal, and abandoned. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? Section four on page four at the bottom. Starting on line 16, has to do with the rights of the innocent owner. And once again, this was text that is a carryover I think you discussed previously. And the changes to this section really are changing um, capitalization and then changing state treasurer to commissioner of BGS. So it's really conforming with the prior changes. Section five is Firearms are rel relinquished pursuant to relief from abuse, order, storage, fees, and return. And the important text is actually on the top of page six. The new language added is that um, the Vermont State Police will follow the procedure described in section 2305 of this title, and that was the section that we just looked at. And um, I'm sorry, I forget the explanation for that. I heard it, but I um, forget why the language was added in. I think it was just to conform to the fire section. But that's right. Yeah. I can check on that if there's yeah. anyone. I, I think you're right. That's right. You're right. Yeah. So then we get to section six, which is the background check. So if you see on page six, starting with subsection A, you have the definitions, and I just talked about the definition of firearm. And once again, this change will now exclude antique firearms. Then you have the other definitions of immediate family member, law enforcement officer, license dealer, transferee, transferor, and the trans transfer and unlicensed person. That's all language I think you've looked at before. <coughs> Are there any questions about those definitions? And again, we're still in. The bill that came up with the Senate. Then you get to the meat of this new section, which is on page seven, starting line four with B1, and it states that an unlicensed person shall not transfer a firearm to another unlicensed person unless, and then you have the mechanism for the background check requirements, which I think it has been described to you and heard testimony about it also. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Two on line 12, proceeding through line 15, um, has a requirement that a person shall not um, make a false statement or exhibit false ID. And then starting on C on line 16, has the language about the licensed dealer who agrees to facilitate the transfer and how he or she shall comply with all the requirements of state or federal law, etc. 
Remember, the new language was added in on line 20, but shall not be considered a vendor. And as I explained yesterday, that is dealing with <coughs> sales tax. That's why that was added in. Barbara, does this speak to age at all? Like, again, I, I'm continuing to think about how to make sure guns don't get into the hands of children. And so I just wondered if it, if it doesn't seem to say anything about age, but obviously if it's one license to another license. Well, it's, you, know, you read all provisions of this amendment if they become law together. So okay. if the age to purchase is raised, it would that affects everything else. So you wouldn't be able to um, go to the FFL and do the transfer unless you were the required age, et cetera. So unless we're grandfathering or something. right, okay. but they all would connect. I mean, um, okay. I just want to make sure that it's clear that it would. Yes, you, you read it as a totality. So all the provisions should be followed. They all should be observed. They all would connect to each other. So transfer from one immediate family member to another. Again, it's even though we're silent on age, it is. They would still have to well, you would, you other. would look at the yeah, I just, age again, restriction first, the and then you know? yes, you look at the okay. law or in this. It wouldn't be ambiguous. I, I don't think okay. so. Not the way this is no. Thank I don't you. think so. Yes. Can I just add something real quick? So the, the form that they have, that everybody would have to fill out uh, for the transfer, I'm going to forget the number of the form again, 4473. Uh, the very first <coughs> sentence at the top uh, of the form is, you may not receive a firearm if prohibited by federal or state law. And this would be prohibiting uh, state law. So. Thank you. Yeah. In the language I gave earlier about false ID, a false statement, mm -hmm. that would prohibit trying to get around the requirements of law. Thank you. Any other questions about this? Great. So um, where was the rest of you? I talked about sales tax provision. And then page eight, you have the fee language and what happens if the licensed dealer uh, attempts to do the background check and for some reason it comes up that the uh, purchaser should not be allowed to have, or the transfer, or should not be allowed to have a firearm, how to return it. Then you have on page eight, starting in line eight in D, you have the sanction for uh, transferring a firearm uh, <coughs> without following this procedure. And then you have the exceptions. Are there any questions about those provisions? Okay. Going to line nine, under four, you have the carve out that allows a person to transfer in order to prevent imminent harm. And then you have the language we just talked about, which is the immunity from civil or criminal liability for a dealer who, in good faith, attempts to do the background check and carry out their duties. Actually, I, I do have a question. Sure. We had added in uh, veterans, and I'm looking at page 8, line 15, 16. It says, or member of. Right, so veterans, is that, I assume that was a discussion with Eric and the so somebody in this committee? It's the next, I'm going to Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Wrong section. Okay. Sorry. Now we're on to the age restriction, which is section seven, starting on page nine. Four zero two zero sale of firearms to minors prohibited. So this is the raising the age to twenty one. Did you see under B? These are the carve outs. Does not apply to a law enforcement officer. And once again, the language that limited that to purchasing a firearm for purposes of his or her duties has been removed. So it's a law enforcement officer in general, an active or veteran member of the military. Proceeding to page 10, a person who provides the seller with a certificate of completion of a hunter safety course. So people who fit within these carve-outs could buy the firearm, even though they were not 21 years old. 
Any questions about those? Then we get to the definition of what constitutes firearm, and this is similar to the same as the definition I just talked about earlier. It excludes certain types of firearms. Any questions about any of that? Section 8 is a large capacity ammunition feeding devices, in other words, large capacity magazines. And as we talked about yesterday under A, it states that a person shall not manufacture, possess, transfer, offer for sale, purchase, receive, or import into the state large <coughs> capacity ammunition feeding devices. Now, as we, I think we also talked about uh, yesterday, um, there is under C, which begins on the bottom of page 10 and proceeds on page 11, there is the uh, grandfather clause, that this only pertains to large capacity magazines that are um, lawfully possessed as a language now, honorably for the effective date of this act. Then under D, starting on page 11, it states that this section shall not apply to large capacity feeding devices and you have certain exceptions. So for a US. Yeah, yeah. yeah just one question yep. on the uh, um, ammunition feeding devices. Uh, lawfully possessed on or before, and uh, of course this act takes effect on passage, so if I ordered a large capacity magazine today and didn't have it by the date of passage. It's possessed, it's in your okay. possession. So I would read this as you had to have received <coughs> that okay. magazine. So if now, it's ordered and paid for, it's right. considered possessed. So of course it would depend if this goes to the governor when he or she signs it, he, you know, assuming it's Governor Scott, so, you know, that would be a specific date. Um, people have to be aware of that. Right. I don't know whether someone would actually be prosecuted for missing it by a day or two back, but theoretically it could be. So. Under. Yeah, um, on the internet thing, so important to the state. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but the dealer, the gun dealer who was here to testify, said that um, you can order it online and it isn't shipped to the person, it is shipped to a, an FFL dealer. Mm -hmm. Who I can't remember who does them, the background check at that point. But it's not like it's like an internet sale, like you're getting shoes from. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody remember that? It seemed like there was a way of. Uh, not allowing it to be. I think those were firearms, not <coughs> not for magazines. Not for magazines. This is just for magazines. Right. Okay. But just to be clear, the way I read that lawfully possessed, it means you have it in your possession. It's in your home or wherever. So in transit, but not. Yeah, yeah but it doesn't go shit. to the person. They don't possess it until after it goes to a dealer. That was just for firearms. Firearms, right. okay. And then you had to go through all the other stuff that you go through. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't here for that test. Yeah, so I don't that was what he said. Yeah. Any other questions about that language? Okay. I think our, my question may be for you. I, I don't know if there was discussion um, last week that I missed related to discussing the grandfathering. I'm, I'm just kind of curious about, that's the way the bill came from the Senate. Is that right? And no, it's not. It's a minute. OK, all right. Right, so, so I mean, one concern I have, as Tom was talking about that, is if we are concerned about these types of guns, one, have we had a discussion about people having them in Vermont that already have them, and two, people getting them between, oh, the, there's going to be a law, let's get hundreds of them before this law passes, and it not necessarily doing what we're concerned about. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there has been discussion, I don't remember uh, who or when, but. But um, yeah, I mean, we did we did look at that and looked at the different options and what different states do, and some do, uh, some don't allow grandfathering, uh, and some do allow grandfathering. 
Um, there, there is a document that talks about that uh, online that uh, Gun Center Vermont that we provided uh, yesterday. Um, but the, the concept was there's a couple things. First of all, that if it didn't allow for that possession, uh, all of a sudden a lot of people in Vermont, law-abiding people, may be possessing them and then all of a sudden are violating the law. Uh, the second thing was, well, how do we get those out of people's hands and the concept of where they would go, how they would be you know, destroyed or taken it was another issue. The, the third issue really went to, to enforcement and through discussion with uh, in, input from David Cahill. Uh, what at least he is one state's attorney who he wants to be able to go after or uh, whose behavior he wants to affect. Are, are those out-of-state sellers who sell by the internet into the state because the FFLs in the state will stop selling them. And yes, there will be magazines for a while. This is, this is not going to immediately solve the problem. And even if we didn't have the grandfathering, it wouldn't. But it's going to constrict uh, the circulation of this particular uh, item, and, and it should increasingly help us. It's the concept behind this. And did we talk at all about having a buyback as one of the options if people <coughs> voluntarily want to get rid of some of their guns that are that currently have them? Again, so certainly that is something that, that I talk to people about and consider with this. I don't remember if it was in testimony. Uh, that would put this on a whole different route uh, as far as having to go to the Appropriations Committee, et cetera, and, and I'm not sure what would happen with it in that case. Just I, to this section is the magazines. That's not yeah, the just the magazines. Yeah. Well, I was just going to kind of echo what Martin was saying, and just if you look at the period where there was a similar early enacted federal ban, it looks specifically like there was kind of this tailing, it, you know, it took a while to um, reduce the presence of magazines, but it did, but it did happen, it tailed off, and then when the ban was not renewed, it and I would suggest, uh, you know, I read it into the record yesterday, but take a look at okay. uh, right. no, the yeah. email that's on, yeah. on okay, thank the you. website. I think that yeah. helps. I'll connect that dot. <laughs> yeah. And I, I appreciate the grandfathering because I think it's important to have a balance. And I think that's what we're trying to do is trying to. So that's helpful for me to hear yeah. because I just was just, trying to. Yeah, you know, just trying to balance out. here. And, and again, um, trying to keep 55 as close to the center as possible. And when we have grades from that to to be, um, you know, at least it's, it's, it's re recognizing their restrictions, but um, but to be at least restricted. We're still on page 11. Now we're in subsection D, and these are carve-outs. States the section shall not apply to any large capacity ammunition feeding device, and then there's a number of carve-outs. I won't read them all, but we talked about them previously, and it includes uh, transferred or possessed by state or federal law enforcement officer for legitimate law enforcement purposes, uh, possessed by an individual in four who's retired from service in a law enforcement agency, and such a uh, magazine was given to him or her upon his or her retirement. So there's a number of exceptions or carve-outs, uh, including on page 12, uh, five, and this is manufactured, transferred, possessed by a manufacturer for the purposes of testing and experimentation. Um, any questions about those carve-outs or exceptions? And then C is the definition. So this is the definition of what constitutes the large capacity ammunition feeding device, and it means any magazine or similar device that has a capacity of or can be readily restored or converted to accept more than 10 rounds of ammunition. Section 9 is the bump fire stock prohibition, and it defines a bump fire stock in A, which is starting in line 13, and then in B it simply states that a person shall not possess a bump fire stock, and a person who violates this shall be in prison not more than one year, fine not more than $1,000 or both. This is the blanket prohibition. Page 876. 
And then last but not least, section 10, the effective date, as was indicated earlier, effective upon passage. Um, I do have a question. Um, we're not looking at the effective date of the or lines five and six, mm -hmm. as part of the definition, we include in the definition manufactured after, and, and yet when I go back and I turn to page 10, I'm thinking of the what if scenario that, you know, a magazine uh, is from another state where it's legal, and it was manufactured prior to this date, Okay. And then it is, you know, it it is unwelcome in Vermont based on lines 14 through 16. But I'm wondering if putting that date up there circumscribes the universe of uh, items that would be impacted on 14 through 16, lines 14 through 16. I can't say why that date was added in. I don't know if that was a subject for discussion or not. Um, but Did so the, you see the, what I mean about the I, I think I do understand what you're saying. Um, so the definition is a device manufactured after July first, twenty eighteen, and then it has a capacity of ten rounds or more. Uh, then under the rest of the statute, it talks about the carve-out for possessing the, the grandfather clause, as I described earlier. Um, that's okay to possess such a device prior to the effective date. I don't think they'll contradict each other. I, I see what you're saying, but I'm just trying to think out factually how it would work out if I ordered one on the so internet and I received it. Right, there's a, yeah. there's a magazine made in the state of Wisconsin in the year 2005. And I live in Vermont, and I say, well, actually, that's not prohibited because in Vermont, mm. the statute says it must be manufactured yeah. after July 1, 2018. <laughs> so therefore, my magazine that was made in 2005 would not be subject to lines 14 through 16. Interesting argument. So, so I, I, on the same language, I have a slightly uh, different uh, concern uh, of, of perhaps an inconsistency. And, and that is between that same date that we're talking about on line 6 and page 12, and then uh, on line 19 and 20 on the top of page 11, as far as the possession. It can't be, uh, one can possess it, uh, the device if it was lawfully possessed on or before the effective date of this act. And then we have this yes. July 1st, 2018 date. So, so it would seem yeah. like the July 1st, 2018 date should be consistent and say the effective date of this was act. Was the effective date changed uh, or the last? I have not okay. here. So let me talk to Eric. Let me, there may be a reason for that. So there's a two I, issues. I think it's a point. Let me follow up with him. I see what you're, you're saying. It's an interesting point. Let me talk to him and see if there's a reason why. It may just have been what the effective date was. We'll circle back to you and let you know. Circle back to the committee. No. I'm sorry, I just need to call from my kid, but so Martin, was it your intent that there would that those two things would true up? I mean I, I think I have the same question as Kimberly, like why why do we need an effect a manufacturing date in the section at all? Mm. I agree. That that I mean, and we had we did make some changes to you know, A and C, and, and uh, didn't really look at the effect it might have on me. Well, does the committee agree they should be trued up? I'll ask. See if Eric, if there's some legal reason, assuming there's not. Does the well, committee agree it should true up to? Hmm. I'm not sure I do agree because if the intent is to to ban them, are we really saying we're only going to ban things that are manufactured from the effective date no, moving I forward? I, I think I think we strike uh, we strike uh, the manufacturers after July first. Yeah, that would be my preference. I mean, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to do that. 
I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I was talking to Can you repeat what you're saying, Martin? Uh, that on uh, page 12, line 5 to 6, we yeah. strike manufactured after July 1st, 2018. That may have had a reason previously, but it doesn't make any sense now. <laughs> And once again, assume there's no legal reason why the language is in here. Just let's assume that for argument's sake. Does the committee agree that that should come out? Yeah. That would solve the discrepancy. Okay. So then it would, yeah. do, it would go from feed strip to that has a capacity. That how it would. Correct. Let's say uh, line five, magazine belt drum oh, feed strip or similar device oh, okay. that has a capacity of, and then it will continue. Do you mind if I send a quick email to come back? Not at all. Not at all. Responding to emails. Yeah, then then that'd be perfect. I think he's stuck in the other committee, but go ahead. <laughs> so we we already covered bump stock before we uh, talk about date. Yeah, yeah. Before we go on, it's, sure. uh, I'm kind of backtracking here. I wanted to make sure you were done with this issue. Yes. But, um, with, with magazines again. So uh, if I own a uh, high capacity up till you know, before the date, whatever. Um, after that, they would be uh, illegal in a sense. But so I can possess one, but I just want to make it clear that I can still use it. I think that's the assumption. Yes, yes. Well, let's look at the language. So, I mean, this talks <laughs> about if, if I can possess it and, and not use it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just not clear on that. I, I, there's nothing that, if you lawfully possess a 15 round magazine, say it's 15 round magazine once again, so you possess it before the effective date of this act. So that would be a large capacity magazine. You have that in your possession before the effective date of that. I don't see anything here that bars you from using it. I'd be more comfortable if there was something in there that says we could, that it could be used. That's just. Um, but. Well, I think we're not forbidding the use. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 so, I, I so Martin, you're, you're looking at, at that. So you're pretty com well, confident a little bit. Well, let's look at the language. Well, um, um, a person shall not manufacture, manufacture, possess, transfer, offer for sale, purchase, receive, or import into the state. So is that the operative? Well, that and C. Yeah, yeah. And C, okay. So in answer to your question, yes, I am confident. Because if the law doesn't bar you from doing something, you can do it. So this bill, this language, allows you to possess large capacity magazines if you had that before the effective date. It doesn't have any language that says you can't use it if you lawfully possess it. So therefore, yes, you can use it. Policy question of whether you add language or not, that's up to the committee. Right. But legally, okay. I, I think that's to a lawyer clear. Yeah. I don't know if it's you know, right. would be clear to a regular person reading or not. But no, thank you. I, I, sure. I feel comfortable sure. with it now. Any other? Okay. In section six, uh, under two, immediate family members means a spouse, parent, step parent. Oh, no. Then it goes on to say child, step child. Um, so I just give me one. Gotcha. Okay. 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 Yep. And what I don't see here, I have two stepchildren. I have six step grandchildren who have been my my grandchildren since the day they were born. My guns will be given to them someday. The, the step grandchildren, who I consider grandchildren, it, can I do that with this law? You're saying that you have step grandchildren. Um, it doesn't clearly state that. Well, I, I'm sure I, like it too. Yeah. Yeah, I think it should. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. So it should be step grandparent or step grandchild. Step, uh, maybe a step grandparent? Or a step grandchild. Step child. Step child. Step child. Would, so as but you would bequeath it to them. I, yes. be, then I guess they could bequeath it to you. All right. So okay. Yeah, they wouldn't be bequeathing so. anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this means you're going to vote for it, right? <laughs> I'd vote for that particular thing, but no, the rest of it still no. Are we adding in step grand 
step-parent and step-grandchild or just step-grandchild? Well, step-grandchild... It seems like we should do both just to be consistent. Right. right. Not like well, it's an unlikely scenario. And all that. Yeah, I don't yeah, think it, it's it doesn't, doesn't matter to me what one bit as long as my grandkids can get my guns and they don't go to the state for disposal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 I think they have to be just because we're, we're saying any of these people in this category, if, if they fall within the category, then they're not required to have a background check. But if you leave one of them out, that person would still fall yep. under the right. of meeting. <coughs> May I, may I stay on that topic? Sure. I'm sure. Yeah. And on that, then, too, I'm, again, I'm thinking about that direct line, then, too. I mean, because we also we have a, we, we do have a, an older population in Vermont. Um, because we're going parent, grandparent, does that, does that also exclude the great grandparent? So I'm, I'm thinking, like, my kids are great grandparents. And so, would the great grandparents not be covered? I mean, because I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, consistent yeah. with that direct line. Yeah. And that is, and on that, go back to our stuff on parentage, um, would this language w cover all that we define under parentage to parentage? So would a de facto parent still be deemed a parent under this? And no, no, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not laughing at you. It's a good point. No, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm being very good point. But I'm being very good point. At least we've <laughs> made a determination that, you know, I those parents are just as important as, right. As, right. as other parents. So, so I think they I, would under parent. Yeah. Yeah, Fine. that would. I would, yeah. yeah. That, Okay. It might yeah. be litigated. I don't know what to say, but I, I think yeah, under I think the recent decision, it would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it would be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, what about the great grandparents? Though? What about a coroner? No, what? What about oh, cousins? <laughs> <laughs> what about cousins? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a question for the committee. What no, you add in great grandparents? Yeah, I'm being asked. No, I think of that a lot too. Yeah. So, yeah. is there a deal with great grandparents also in that lineage? So are we talking just great grandparents or step great grandparents? I want all of it. All the all, all the <laughs> well, no, I, just, I mean well like yeah, that whole line. Yeah. We show up on ancestry.com. Yeah, you. you oh, no. <laughs> there's actually a there's a pretty good chance in the next couple of years I'll probably have a, a step great grandchild. So that person might be in line for a weapon or two. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And just so I'm clear, because I think this is moving along, we're adding in. Um, Step grandparent, step grandchild, great grandparent, and also step great grandparent, and, and and step great grandchild. Okay. And great grandchild. <laughs> I think we already had that. Okay. Any other changes? And for the next draft, you want the uh, highlighted the highlights out? Yeah. This be more of a finished version. Um, yeah. So, sure. um, so we're going to take, um, take a little bit of testimony. Um, are you able to make these changes? Yep. For us? Okay. That'd yep. Be, that'd be I, do, I do want to talk to Eric and by hand just in case or something I missed. But yes, we can okay. we can do this quickly one way or the other. Yep. Okay. So I remove the stricken language. Uh, remove the highlights. Um, obviously, we'll come in and show you what's new from this current version, but get this ready as a final version. Great. Yep. And so, okay. um, how about 103245? Uh, we'll do the best we can. I would like to also run it through editing one more time as the new language, just in case there's no typos or mistakes, because we're. Okay. So, we'll do everything we possibly can. So, what is. What does that mean? Okay. It means I'm not sure. Well, I'll get moving on right now. Let me just get moving on and see how long it takes, and I can circle Sometimes back to you. Sometimes you've done it without going to the end. Understood. Yeah. Understood. Of course, if it's taking a long time, you can do that. I'll, yeah. I'll let you know. Okay. So why don't, um, can yeah. you check back with me at 1030 just to see where you're at? It's not okay. before. Absolutely. Okay. Sure. Anything else from anybody? Okay.
Thank you. I understand what you want to say. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Just uh, three quick things. Yeah. A minute or two. You do get a little better at gymnastics working here on the rooms here. For the record, my name is Bill Moore. I represent the Vermont Traditions Coalition on Firearms Policy as a volunteer advocate. Um, and I gotta say, it's amazing what Ledge Council could do when, they need to be, when it needs to be done. It always blows my mind a little. Um, so I wanted to update you on some items that have happened that have happened in terms of our outreach and advocacy with uh, our members and the public in general in Vermont. There was a gun show this last weekend, and literally in a day and a half, uh, we had over 650 letters signed opposing the underlying bill and the amendments that have been discussed. So obviously the letter wasn't completely up to date with some of the changes you made since Sunday. Um, and that was a, a moderate effort, uh, but it was pretty much 99.9% .9 of folks attending that gun show saying, this won't solve school safety issues. I don't understand why they're doing it. Okay. Can I just ask a quick, when you say the underlying bill, you with mean S55, with, yeah. with S6 attached? The well, I just, just S55 as it came and then was amended. This, I just oh, want right, right. to clarify that I'm talking about the whole package. Yeah. Oh, that with all the long amendments? Yeah, the, yeah. But not the underlying storage. Storage and disposition. Storage and disposition. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not addressing right. that because okay. I worked constructively okay. on that solution. Um, right. And we still support that yes. particular change in statute, just not right. the vehicle. Right. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I might add, not to confuse, but just to have a little fun with um, the whole thing of lineage and grandchildren and this and that, we were playing around with it. And I came up with um, non-adoptive, non-custodial, cohabitating parents, children. So you could get pretty funny if you, if you think through this thing. Um, in a normal modern family, um, there can be non-marriage uh, relationships that are as strong and long in my family. Particularly, I have two non-adopted step-grandchildren because we never married. And um, I now have a grandchild, a great-grandchild coming along. So there's that. Um, we did that bill already. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't mean to poke fun, and I appreciate your time. So um, the other thing is that it's come to my attention that after a long um, relationship, um, a gentleman was able to offer one of the House members a lengthy, detailed um, demonstration regarding magazines, how they're used, why they're used, uh, um, such little facts as 90% of handguns sold today have magazine capacities in excess of 10 rounds. So basically the entire industry has tooled up to provide 12 to 15, 17 round magazines for most of the semi-automatics. So how that ends up impacting um, gun stores and gun owners uh, who are looking at purchasing firearms um, as tools for self-defense is, is it something that needs to be reiterated again, choices of tools for self-defense. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, so my understanding is that there's, uh, there's a so-called California version or, uh, of the various handguns because they have a 10-round band, a band. And so that there is this market in California and perhaps in the other states that have that band. Can, can you comment on that? On, on how I don't know the proportions. Henry Perro probably could address that better. I, I'm aware that there are certain companies that have made limited numbers of their models available with those types of capacities. Um, it's more likely they would remanufacture the magazine itself as an unmodified, unmodifiable, if you'll excuse the term, version. Um, but you'd have to ask the industry that. Um, I doubt if they'd tool up for Vermont. Um, but I, but again, that's, that would be a question for Henry Perro. What I was getting at is I've got a resource, and it's never too late to have good information. Um, Randy Lopes, um, from the information I have in this email, he's a Burlington police officer, competitive shooter, and firearms instructor for both the Burlington Police Department and the Vermont State Police Academy. He's available to redo this presentation he did with one of the House members here. Uh, I have her name, but I don't have her permission to, to, to say it. Um, they had a long, long meeting, and uh, what the email here says is that uh, after the presentation, 
Uh, Carol came to the conclusion that uh, uh, this was sort of a silly idea that won't achieve the goals that, as far as the magazine being, just that part of your bill. Um, and that gentleman is available and would like to come even if it's after this vote. Um, we could work with the committee to set that up in, say, in room 11 for Friday morning or something, whatever the schedule is. He's anxious to be helpful. He's a professional. He's way smarter than I am. And it's out there, and I'd be happy to provide the information necessary to set that up. Um, and, and, you know, finally I repeat myself. The necessary tools for the choice of exercising your self-defense Second Amendment rights in the home when you restrict them, you're really gonna you're really gonna hurt the people you don't want to hurt, and that's gonna be the families and individuals, particularly single women living in questionable places or in remote places that want to make those choices. And I think the difference between nine rounds and twelve rounds really shouldn't be the purvey of the state in this case. So that's it. If there's um, any questions, so, yeah, if you could um, please provide us I will. this information, and then. Do you have copies of those? You said 650 letters. We're going to provide them. Uh, we have the, we have them scanned so that we can provide a, a set for the governor's office as well, okay, and I will get them to the committee. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you so much. So I have one quick question for you. Absolutely. Can, is there anything um, that you have that supports your last statement about why it's hurting women who need that kind of gun? The largest, the the, the fastest growing sector of handgun purchasers in this country in the last 15 years has been women. That that can be backed up and I'll, I can but, find the data not, for you. I'm not concerned not about their gender. I guess you well, said it's important. it hurts. I keep seeing data that shows that if you have a gun in your house for safety reasons, it doesn't make you safer. And so if you have research that shows that it makes women safer to have guns that are, you know, able to shoot 10 rounds, so that, that would be good to see. There are smarter people than me that can expound on this, but the, but the statistics you're referring to are based on when there's a criminal or violent incident, when there is a, a domestic violence incident, or when there's an incident of crime, if there's also a gun in the home, that seems to have some increase in the statistical likelihood that there'll be a firearms injury, but it doesn't differentiate let me finish. Doesn't differentiate between the gun in the home being owned by the homeowner or being owned by the criminal or the intruder or a drunk neighbor that came into the house. So what you have is sort of a is sort of a straw man. If there's no guns, then the violent act could be perpetrated by any other thing. And it kind of cherry picks. Now I don't dispute that domestic violence um, victim advocates have a genuine need for the police to be able to respond in the home and remove guns when it's appropriate through the version of S221 that we worked hard to support, we would have that tool. So I'm not disputing that there is validity to your argument, but those statistics tend to lump things together in a way that doesn't tell how many times a gun is used by women or men, elderly or young, handicapped or what, regardless of color, regardless of race, the rest of this is used to deter crime without a shot being fired. Because the most likely use of a gun to deter a crime or deter an incident or deter an attack doesn't involve an actual discharge of the firearm. And those statistics are available through the Justice Department. So I think we just need to take them all just a little bit, the statistic that you're referring to with a little bit of a grain of salt, and remember that and an individual right, the exercise of that right sometimes requires a tool. Um, whether it's my mouth, that computer, or a printing press in Ben Franklin's day, limiting the choice of the tool to exercise that right to an individual is always something we should take extremely seriously and err on the side of strict, strict caution. So more children are injured by guns in their homes than they are in schools. And we know that... Than they are in schools? Yeah. Well, that sure, makes, that's true. That tells me that injuring, being injured by a firearm in a school is very rare, but it doesn't tell no, me a it lot. No, it isn't rare. It just means that the other one is more. It's statistically rare. But um, I do apologize. I mean, I, I still think. I mean, I think what Representative Burgesson was asking for was. I mean, the 
it was a generalized comment that I think we were making for a dramatic effect that didn't actually have a factual component to it. Um, because a woman with a lower capacity gun still has a gun to protect herself in those unsavory places. I appreciated the fact that you did speak to the fact that if there is an intrusion that more often it will, it's not about the gun being discharged, it's about having that gun present. I know that because I lived that and experienced that. Thank you. But so again, I, I want to, I know that this is very hard and emotional, but we want to honor everyone in this, and there are victims in all of this too. So I just, I, if there is something that ties to your final statement, I would appreciate being able to see it. But I do understand as well, because if you were just, okay. feeling like you just had to say something. And again, you know I think I mean? this gentleman can address some of that. And um, in the final analysis, I try not to be emotional or passionate about any of this or use statistics in that in the furtherance of anything emotional um, because to me I have to start from the fact that it's an individual right and therefore everything else that I say will flow from that that's my principle um, and I, I you know I have, I have rape victims in my family I have you know we've been we've experienced crime in my family just I, everybody's got an anecdote or a cousin with an or neighbor with an anecdote they don't serve to inform the debate about restricting an individual right, a constitutional right. It's difficult not to go what there. They do because I'm sympathetic to She still to has it. a gun, and that's still her right, and we're not taking that away. Um, can you please tell me the name again of the um, law enforcement officer mm -hmm. you referred to? Oh, yeah, I'll forward um, a version of the email um, to Mike. Um, I just um, moved off it briefly here. Hold on. Randy. It's Randy Lopes, okay. and uh, I have his cell number and his email address, and I will forward that so Mike can share it to you. I have to scrub the email because it's got some other stuff in it. Any other questions? Thanks again. I appreciate it. I know last minute's always kind of crazy. I did hear from Eric, and uh, he doesn't see a problem with uh, removing that language uh, regarding the date. That that was just something that the 2018. The correct that on, on uh, page 12, line five and six. Did he say why? Or he said I don't know. Well, my question to him was. Was there any reason that we can't strike that language and that it causes some concern regarding, regarding how there it is? There it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh, we'll let him talk. Oh. Boston's sitting in the seat, too. So actually, we're done. Do you want me to turn it over? Martin was about to, we're looking at the um, language of 2018, the July, but not to strike that, the manufacturer date. Uh -huh. So I really, I can sit down with you for a minute? In one minute. Okay. So, right. yeah. okay. Then you want to I will let him. I was close. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Do you have a question for her? Um, no, I just wonder if we're going to have a break for a minute as well. Just yeah. So, um, so let's take a break. Um, and uh, well, actually, can you read his email? Oh yeah. It's. Um, I asked him if there was a reason to take it out. He said, I don't know, it's from the federal uh, Massachusetts definition. Since you have the grandfathering, uh, maybe you don't need it. I guess that's not a definitive answer. We need to, I thought it was more definitive. We need to hear it, I think, a little bit more. Vision. But I think the initial impression is that it doesn't sound like it's tied to the bill that was a definitive legal reason he had to have it in there. But you know, let's hear from him. I'm here again on the proposed committee strike all to Senate bill number 55 in the upper left hand corner in the parentheses it should say draft number 4.2 does everyone have the right copy either on your iPad or in paper 4.2 so what I'm going to do is talk to you about what's changed from the prior version that we spoke about uh, earlier this, this morning, uh, as you'll notice, all the yellow highlights have been removed. So this is a clean copy. And I'll just lead you through by page and line number what's different. 
Uh, the first substantial difference is on page 6, lines 10 through 13. This is the definition of immediate family member. And uh, I'd appreciate if everyone read it to make sure that I included everything <laughs> you wish to have included. But, I think Gary the is step But what I uh, added, well, what includes now? Let me read it through. Let's, sure. And if there's anything you think is mistaken or inaccurate, please let me know. So immediate family member means a spouse, parent, step parent, child, stepchild, sibling, step sibling, grandparent, step grandparent, grandchild, step grandchild, great grandparent, step great grandparent, great grandchild, and step great grand. Child. I don't so. see house pets on here. <laughs> Moving right along. So. Do not get my mud out of here. <laughs> the next change is on page nine, and this is not something you'll see in the text, but if you look down on uh, this section, shall not apply to lines 14 through 20. If you remember, the prior version had was highlighted but had some stricken language. I took out the stricken language because this is all new text. It wasn't necessary to include it, but this is the definitions we talked about earlier. And then the final change is on page 12, and this is I removed the date that Representative Jessup had caught, which was um, the July 1st. So now it reads, E, as used in this section, large capacity ammunition feeding device means a magazine, belt, drum, feed strip, or similar device that has a capacity of or that can be readily restored and converted to accept, et cetera. There used to be a date in there, and we took it out. So there's no longer the reference to the date. But those are all the changes. Are there any questions about anything else? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I would like to make a motion that we draft, uh, that we um, move to take up draft number 4.2 of S55 and pass it in its entirety. I'll second. Second. Okay. Should we have discussion or should I, I would like to make motion now, though, if now is the appropriate time as far as dividing the vote. Um, I think okay. I will make a motion now to divide the vote, and here's how I'd like to see it divided for okay. folks. So slowly? <laughs> yep. Okay. Sections one through five. Okay. So, and you'd like to vote on that first? Or are you going to uh, yeah, I'd like to vote on that first. Um, section 6. Okay, so 1 through 5 is the, that's the underlying. That's all the, dis, uh, it's the storage and disposition of firearms held by law enforcement. Okay, so part of the underlying bill, yeah. Okay, and then yep. section 6. Section 6 is the firearms transfer background check. I'd like to vote on that one separately. Okay. Section 7, yeah. the sale of firearms to minors. I'd also like to vote on that separately. And this is the order you'd like to, to vote on them? I, I think the order of the bill is fine, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, section 8, the large capacity ammunition feeding devices also separately. Okay. And Section 9, the bump fire stocks separately. Should I have the effective date as a separate one as well? Any opinions on that of where I should place that? Or I would no, recommend, no, first. if I may, probably go through all those sections and then we'll have a final vote over what's left. Okay. Well, we have to do that, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. I mean, but, but, but the effective date then would, would be germane, I think, just the final okay. bill anyway. Right, okay. right. Good. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, so that's a, uh, a motion to divide it. Do I have a, um, a second to, to divide it? I have a question. Um, okay, question? Yep. Um, is it going to be divided on the floor like this? It, it can be. It could be. I, you know, I don't I would, know. I would, I would, I would think I would so. Think. I would think so. But Should we check, so with, we we check with the... With, with, um, well, that doesn't... What happens on the floor separate from what happens in here? Well, I thought you said the same rules apply here that then they do on the floor. Meaning, meaning that you can ask for division in here. If nobody asks for a divisional there, then that's fine. But we are we will have recorded our votes uh, on the, these divided questions. Right, and the reason, as we talked about, the reason why we talked about this a number of times last week is that um, that I wanted to give 
you know, if people wanted it, I wanted to give them the opportunity to vote on on different sections. So, and, you know, Chip had talked about it last week that, for instance, he might vote for certain sections, but in the end, vote against the bill. So that's. Um, okay. Yeah. So, with the process we're going through. Um, we don't. We have a motion on the floor that's been seconded. We don't have to address that before we do. You do the. Do we have to do that first before we do anything else. No, we do the divided yeah. questions and then we go back to that original motion. For okay. The whole bill. No, I didn't know the process. Okay. Did we have a second yet? Yeah. 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 Is this time for discussion? Sure. I would like to hear. Um, uh, description from uh, the vice chair about how and how you managed to buy a semi-automatic hunting gun for your son in New Hampshire, if that's what I heard correctly last week. Uh, he bought a gun for himself. Uh, uh, I, I can't remember the name of it, but I think he told me it was named Czechoslovakia. Um, there's a store in Wells River that, um, that's a sporting goods store. Um, they sell used as, as well as new. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's very bought. And they're an FFL, and he did his background checks, and he was over the correct age, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And he's a hunter. Uh, actually, not a hunter. He just likes shooting guns. He did charter practice, and yeah. Yeah, we, when he, so he lives down in Lebanon, New Hampshire, um, uh, and but in a place where he can't really use his his guns around his house, so he yeah. brings them up often, and we go out. And, Shoot things. Yeah. Okay. Just found it interesting. <laughs> That's what we did. <laughs> okay. So the um, so the um, first thing that we are voting on are sections one through five. Yeah. It's going to be the applicability of chapter, mm -hmm. the unlawful firearms um, agency, yeah. the a disposition of unlawful firearms, yeah. the um, rights of innocent owner, and the require firearms relinquished pursuant to relief from abuse order storage fees return. call the roll on sections one through five as divided. Um, Colburn. Yes. Dickinson. Yes. Jessup. Yes. Malone. Yes. Morris. Yes. Rachelson. Yes. Vienne. No. Wilhoy. Yes. Burdett. No. Conquest. Yes. Grad. Yes. So that will be nine to favorable. The um, next section is um, section six, uh, which is entitled Firearms Transfer Back Checks. So the six by seven. No, I have, I have yeah. yeah, that's, that's what Mario was saying. So I'm here with that. Wait, that's not in it. Okay, yeah, sorry. So I was just trying to know, so we have vote one, vote two, so I have all the sections okay, here, right. and then final vote is recommended out there. So okay. that's, how I'm, that's how I'm doing it. Okay, yep. so the clerk shall commence okay, the may, may I have a look at it real quick again? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. 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 I just want to make sure. Yeah, so it's section one, six, yeah. which goes page six, page seven, page eight, and then um, through line eight of page nine. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. So. Coburn. Yes. Dickinson. No. Jessup. Yes. Malone. Yes. Morris. Yes. Rachelson. Yes. Viennes. No. Wilhoyt. No. Burden. No. Conquest. No. Grab. Yes. Six five favorable. As to section six. Okay. The next. Section is section seven, 
uh, which starts on page 9, entitled Sale of Firearms to Minors Prohibited. And that goes um, through line 8 on page 10. Yeah. Yes, it's called that, um, I'm sorry, that, that last vote was 6-5. 6-5, five. Five, yes. 6-5 favorable. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Coburn. Yes. Dickinson. No. Jessup. Yes. Lalone. Yes. Morris. Yes. Rachelson. Yes. Viennes. No. Wilhoy. Yes. Burden. No. Conquest. Yes. Grad. Yes. So that was eight three favorable. Okay. And the next section is um on page ten. And that goes starting line ten of page ten through line six on page twelve. Coburn. Yes. Dickinson. No. Jessup. Yes. Lalone. Yes. Morris. Yes. Rachelson. Yes. Viennes. No. Wilhoit. No. Burdett. No. Conquest. No. Grad. Yes. So that is 6 5 favorable. As to section 8. Bump stocks on page 12, um, which are lines 8 through 16. Okay. Coburn. Yes. Dickinson. This is number 9. Yeah, this is bump stocks. Yes. Um, Jessup. Yes. Lalone. Yes. Morris. Yes. Rachelson. Yes. Viennes. No. Wilhoit. Yes. Burdett? No. Conquest? Yes. Grad? Yes. So that's 9 2 favorable as to section 9. So now the question is shall the, shall 4.1 pass um, in its entirety following sections? Ready, Madam Chair? Coburn. Yes. Dickinson. No. Jessup. Yes. Lalone. Yes. Morris. Yes. Rachelson. Yes. Viennes. No. Wilhoit. No. Burdett. No. Conquest. No. Grad. Yes. Six five favorable. Thank you. Um, Janice, in the first uh, vote was on section one through five. What was the vote on that? Nine two. Okay. The Madam Chair, um, who who do you want to um, report out to the Delta? I I assumed that, but I was going to make sure. So Martin, okay. this is an easy one, Gary. Are you sure you're not? So, so that you don't want me anywhere near that one. I, I'm passing it over to you, my friend, yes, to, no, to finish the to finish the job. All right, thank you. Is that helpful with the breakdown of sections? Yep, that's good. Yeah. 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 Just one word on, on this. I mean, it, it's no secret, you know, where uh, where I've been all along on this. But um, I, I, and this is just a personal opinion, uh, you know, about the whole process that we just went through. Um, you know, I, I think as far as days this was worked on, um, there wasn't a lot of days, but in those days there was certainly an enormous amount of hours and, and and I think it's important to look at the number of hours we worked on this and not the number of days and the the wide array of you know witnesses that we did have come in here and um, you know, again and, and I don't like it but it, in my opinion the, the the due process that was done here was was very appropriate um, um, I, I, again, I certainly would have liked to see a, a different outcome, but um, uh, 
I, I just think it was uh, it was all done right as far as uh, again the process goes. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I have to say, oh sorry, Gary, go ahead. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, when we started this process, I thought that we t we were looking at it from a, a school safety aspect. Nothing in this bill, as far as I'm concerned, addresses school safety. Uh, I just want to say I appreciate the chairs um, allowing me and, and others, I think, to vote on the individual parts of the bill. I, cause, you know, I can't support the whole thing, but I, there are parts in there that I think are uh, are important um, and that I do strongly support, and I just appreciate being able to express that support in a vote. So it sounds like the Senate is working hard on 422, which, which I'm really quite worried <coughs> about. And, um, and, you know, they, they're still deliberating. So, so certainly things can change. But it's, it's looking very similar to what, what we passed out um, before town meeting. Um, so I think that's encouraging. And, um, and so we'll take out, we have as two, um, 221 as it came over from the Senate. So we'll take that up again. Um, you know, the idea is that um, we're working in parallel um, to, you know, to get the bills pretty much to the governor at the, at the same time. So, oh, great. so we'll do that um, tomorrow. <coughs> and I assume we're going to be on the floor all afternoon. But if if not, um, let's depending on what time it is, let's come back. Um, I do want to start looking at some other Senate bills, even if it's just walkthroughs. Are, are you talking about today? Yeah. Now. Do you know when that joint hearing is for educational? Because I do want to attend. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's right. Three, three to five, five today. Yeah. So okay. I mean, I'm just like, yeah. if, if if we are off, I'll I'll, I'll sure. will likely attend. So. Yeah. <coughs> okay. That's fine. And I would just have to say, I I hope that we do take up the issue of school safety. I know that other committees are also doing work on it, and I. I think it's a top priority for all the obvious reasons. Right. Well, as I said, I think they're. I think the Senate is going to use 675. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when they look at the the conditions of relief part of it, mm -hmm. and that's when we had our um, our felony. Also, was Good, yeah. was that so? Um, so that ex extra language of um, what was it retired? Law enforcement or off-duty law enforcement? That's their language. Well, the off-duty oh, was. No, not the off-duty. Yeah, the off-duty oh, language, and then Gary, um, you know, your your amendment language, and then also put um, Representative Higley. So uh, you know, oh, good. I would ask Senator Sears to, you know, to consider all of that, and then certainly when when we get it back, we'll have the opportunity Great. to to do the same. I, I just want, I mean, I, I can't let Gary's comment just lay unanswered um, or a, a different view. I, I do believe that uh, what we passed uh, here uh, will assist uh, with respect to gun violence, including uh, in schools. Uh, there's definitely broader things that we need to do with respect to school safety, but I do believe that this will uh, present some restrictions, some barriers uh, to individuals who are trying to get a firearm uh, for the purpose of causing harm. Uh, I think some of the language we put in uh, based on input from David Cahill into the ban on uh, large capacity ammunition feeding devices uh, will help in that area as well. The background checks will uh, get people in private sales to be sure who they're selling to, that they're, that they're somebody that's not prohibited. Uh, and, and I think that you know, the bump stocks ban as well, the bump stocks and the high volume magazine, uh, you know, it's not going to be a, it's not going to solve everything. It's not going to eliminate this, uh, but it's definitely going to help. Uh, and it's also going to have the extra benefit of assisting in other areas that this state should take a close, a close look at, and that's the uh, suicide rate by firearms. We have a very high rate, and this also helps in that. So. So I think it's doing more than just school safety. It's not the be-all, end-all answer, and there's still more work to be done. But I do think it, it moves us in the right direction. So. Thank you. Okay. All right. Come on, we adjourn. Okay.